Okay, so we're live again here with Tuesdays with Tony. It's uh, unfortunately it's Wednesday, and my name is Vinny Panella. And I'd first like to talk about our sale that we're having all week at the store here, it's spring clean sale. We're selling with 500 off a lot of these incredible instruments. There's a Powell signature that lists for 64.79, 500 off. Another Powell signature. Uh, it's a, a little different model. This one has the uh, the C sharp trill and the and the, um, and the split E. We have 500 off this Yannick so incredible, beautiful soprano saxophone. All the Broadway players play Yannick Sowers. Why? Because they play so well in tune. And as you can see, we have a wall full here of um, of instruments with that are 500 dollars off. To a couple a couple of Cowworths, alto and tenor. A, a Yannicka, uh, two Yannicka sounds, three Yannicka sounds. These are different models. And the other thing that I wanted to say was, again, we're still open for questions. We're really looking for people to either, uh, you know, call call the store with questions, send an email in. We really would like to get this uh, to be more like a, a forum where we, where we could answer your questions about it, like all types of musical. All, I'm not going to be able to do them all, of course, but, but we have wonderful brass players here and string players. So any questions about instruments, about embouchures, et cetera, et cetera, we want to, uh, we want to address those and have that, have, this to have Tuesdays with Tony become, you know, more like an instructional thing. And our special guest this week is a wonderful tenor saxophone player named Mark Weissman. We're going to go see him right now. Here he is, Mark Weissman. <laughs> oh yeah, they are. Oh, my friend, my friend and colleague. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark and I go back to the year two thousand. Yeah, probably before that a little bit. Yeah, right. they, no, we're right yeah. before that because we, we we met in the Ashby. The Ashby big man. That's right. A wonderful experience. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I remember going to see uh, the, the the Worcester Jazz Orchestra. Uh, yeah. Um, my son at the time was like maybe fifteen. And I, I took a yeah, bunch of high school kids, right. and uh, Eric Shadeen was in the band. He kept saying, yep. you got to check out this band, you got to check out this band. And it was the Worcester Jazz Orchestra, led by Eric French, who That's was right. the owner of this company, who I, I didn't know at the time. Yeah. And, you know, of course I thought, you know, my feeling was, oh, you're like another big band. And this, it was a place called the Above Club <laughs> in Worcester, and the band was killing. And, and, uh, and I was fortunate enough to become a member of the band, like, within a few weeks. I remember leaving the place saying to you gotta get in the band i gotta get this band and I told <laughs> eric's, eric's wife who was his girlfriend at the time fiance at the time oh, was, wow. was taking uh was at the door you, you know? yeah i knew this and i remember direction. walking out the door saying just being blown away and saying i want to be in this band and yeah that was a good band that yeah, was a good band but this guy i remember stand, you know standing up and they were playing you're gonna try oh and, yeah probably and just blew me away and Ever yeah, since then, he's a he's a wonderful guy. <laughs> and uh, feel the same way about Vinny. Right, right. And, and uh, so dedicated, and inspirational man. And you know, he had oh, he had the same horn. Yeah, that's right. But a white mouthpiece. I remember thinking. That's right. It's a brill heart. Nobody plays yeah. white mouthpiece. Yeah, but that's yeah, true. What yeah. It is. So anyway, <laughs> so Mark, so so we'll talk. You know, I don't want to talk about the saxophone. So yeah, so uh, history. You're, you're from. I'm from Western Mass. I grew up in Springfield. I was born in New York. I moved to Springfield when I was about 10. Uh, grew up there, went to school, went to Westfield State College uh, for undergrad in music, uh, jazz studies and music ed. And then I went to UMass Amherst for jazz composition and arranging. Um, at those two places I got to study with Ted Levine and Yusuf Latif I studied with at UMass Amherst. Oh, that's right. And I studied with Lynn Clock also at UMass Amherst. Um, and then after that, I taught in the public schools for about four or five years. Um, and then I went to the military, uh, where I was there for 14 years as a saxophone player. That was my job. Uh, and then um, I studied with Hal Crook for about six years. Like, every month I got to take a lesson with him. It was the greatest, it was the greatest thing about the military was that. Um, and then it, also in the military, I went to NEC and... Uh, studied with Jerry Berganzi and uh, John McNeil was there and Frank Carberg and a whole bunch of other guys I got to kind of hang out with and study with and stuff. So, And then now I'm out of the military and I, I was in California for a little while in the military and then I moved back out here with my family and I've been here for about two years and I teach in 
Brookfield and Brimfield Elementary and go around and play, you know, do whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember, I remember uh, being in the band with you, like, and then all of a sudden you were gone for like a month or so. No, more, because you were yeah. basic. And, yeah, and somebody six told months, me, dude. yeah, what, what, no, but yeah, but yeah. I was, you know, For six weeks, guys six would come weeks. and go, yeah. and then he showed up with like, with like no hair, <laughs> no, and right. I said, what are you doing, man? He says, I'm in the military, and I thought for sure he was busting my traps. He just got a, he just got a haircut. I said, you were in the military. So you were 32? Yeah, I was 32. That's man. correct. Yeah, I was yeah. 32 when so, I went in the military. That's like an old man. It's like, yeah, you're yeah, you're not kidding. Training. Yeah, to be like a, a low-ranking guy in the military yeah. at 32 was weird, because... Yeah. You know, the band guys in the military are typically the most educated, enlisted personnel on the on the yeah. uh, on the base, and so it was weird to be our low-ranking guy and go to like some some non-band thing, and they they would treat you like you were 15, yeah. like you had no idea what was going on, and when you showed that you had a brain in your head, they were stumped. They couldn't yeah. believe that someone right. with you know two stripes on their arm yeah. could, could actually have a yeah. brain in their head. So. Military was. Yeah. I was in the military. That's right. I know. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty different pretty time. Weird, but yeah, yeah different it was time. Strange. So, um, so what else? All right. So yeah. So let's. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear about your your. You know, so I'd like you know we can touch on um, on how you know how you teach a, a younger person your concepts of you know. I always think about tonguing tone and technique. I used to always yeah. tell my students the three T's. So maybe we can touch on those a bit. Uh, equipment wise. You, he plays a King Super Twenty with a with a brass bell, mm -hmm. great horn. He's a great horn. It's probably from yeah, the sixties, maybe. Fifty eight. Fifty eight. Wow. Yeah. And a and a, that's a slant. That's a modern slant, right? Yeah, it's a copy of a slant. Yeah. That's a an uh, Auto Link vintage. Yeah. What's eight, a, eight star. Eight star. Yeah. So the, so Auto Link made um, had been making mouthpieces forever. They made the slants back in the uh, probably the late forties, fifties. Yeah, so I, was, I thought it was the fifties. Yeah, before. and it was a really Steep, you know, sought after mouthpiece, yeah. or so sought after mouthpiece now, right? And uh, they went back and, and, and did a copy, and that's that's a copy, yeah. And Verganzi is the one that suggested this, yeah. Uh, so. Did he ever work on it? No, oh, no, yeah. I never had anyone work on it. You should yeah. one day you should swing it by his place, man. He'll just, I never, you were telling me that the other just, day, I didn't yeah, realize that he worked on, re uh, he worked, on mouthpieces, he's worked on hundreds of mouthpieces. Okay. So, okay. Jer so Jerry Verganzi is an educator who's both of us are brilliant. Tied up with because yeah, he's such. I mean, everybody's tied. He's like, he's the he's the greatest man. He's a wealth of knowledge and a, and a marvelous human being. We're so fortunate to have you so know, a bunch of those kinds of guys. If you're are, a tenor man, what a place know, to be a tenor player. Yeah, in Boston. Okay. Garzon and Billy Pierce and yeah, you know, and uh, that was around Lovano's every once around, in a while. Yeah. There's just dudes yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Every time you throw a stick, you yeah. get a tenor saxophone. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, yeah. So how about? Uh, um, you know, tonguing. But, you know, we'll get into that other thing thing later. I want to. I want to talk to him about Jerry's. Jerry, he's taught me this thing like a month ago that it's blown my mind. I'm, all the saxophone players out there are gonna want to know about this. Yeah, well, it's a Bergonzi thing. It's, not it's a Bergonzi thing. <laughs> it is a Bergonzi thing, but but it's such a cool thing. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah it and I'm really just cool. starting to to figure out. A little bit. Yeah. yeah, took a long time for me. Yeah. So uh, all right. So I'm a beginning student, and uh, I tongue. Tell, talk talk to me about tonguing. Make sure that your tongue is touching the tip of the reed. That's what I'm trying to get. Like yeah. it's, it's, there's a lot of things that go into playing the saxophone. And typically we think of things in a very one-dimensional way. So we'll think of it as notes and rhythms. And we're not thinking about what our hand position is. We're not thinking about where our mouth position is. And so the first thing I want to make sure with really beginning first level students is making sure that their mouth is on the horn the right way. Making sure that they're curling their lip, making sure that their teeth, are, their top teeth, are, are touching the right. mouthpiece but not biting. It's and amazing sometimes the lip. you get a kid that's yeah. been yeah. playing forever and is. Yeah, I, you know, I start them off and the same thing happens. They ah, and they, yeah. they've got all these kind of weird embouchures, and the more you talk to them, mm. it's almost like the less they listen. Yeah. But what I try and tell them is that, um, in terms of tonguing the reed, what I try and tell them is touch the tip of the reed and use the the T sound ta. You, go. you know, excuse me. A lot of people. They have very different ways of tonguing, and I've heard students go ka right. or la right. or da or all these other things. They do the back of the throat. Yeah, they do the back of the throat with ka, and right. then you have to kind of teach them like say the word ta, mm. and then they start to figure that. Joe, out. Uh, Joe Allen would be, would be angry with you. <laughs> because, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> because, because why? Because Joe Allen used to say that when you say ta, yeah, the jaw moves down. Ta. Right. Yeah. So he wanted you to say two. But we'll, oh. Yeah, either way. Yeah, I mean, to yeah. me, oh, da, it's just about... Jerry's talks about da, yeah. you know. 
Well, with beginning students, I want to get the percussive sound of the, the tip of the reed. Yeah. That's, that's the first thing I'm looking yeah. for. Because a lot of times when I have students that go da or la, it's, it's that kind of a legato tongue that I don't want. When right. I'm so yeah. That's kind of why I go away from that. But two, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. I never thought of it that way with the, with the genre. Yeah. Um, what else? Okay, so tonguey tone. Fast air. You know, I, I, uh, I was against long tones for a long time. I hated them, and I always thought that the reason my pitch was so bad wasn't because of me. Couldn't be my fault. It was the saxophone's fault. Mm -hmm. You know, it was someone else's fault. And I had a buddy of mine in the military who's a younger guy, and he's a trumpet player with the most beautiful sound you ever heard in your life. His name is Ben Pay, and he's he's a great guy, but he's a, he's an amazing trumpet player. And one day I just broke down and said, "Okay, you're gonna have to teach me how to you're gonna teach me how to get a good sound." And so he started to talk to me about something about long tones and something specifically that I never thought of, and which was you know when I used to do long tones, I think when people typically do long tones, they think of long tones as just that. You know, we're gonna play a low and it's gonna be long, and what's the point of that? Mm -hmm. Great, we're just playing a long tone. But one of the things that that my friend told me was. It's not about the sound that comes out, it's about the air. It's about the speed of the air. And I never thought of it that way. So he said, yeah, when you're doing a long tone, don't worry about the sound. Just worry about getting the note even and breathing fast air evenly. And what happens with a lot of students, and I tell all my students this now, is that when we get into the high register, we bite. And why do we bite? We bite because we don't have enough air support and we're not blowing fast air. So what you really need to do, in the same way that any tuba player or trumpet player, especially tuba players, they learn how to breathe, we have to generate that sound from our lungs more. What I also tell my kids is that, you know, when you're outside in the you know, water on the lawn and you have a hose and you want the hose to, to push faster water out, you put your thumb on the end of the hose and that gets the air to go faster. Well, that's just like biting. So we're using less surface area and what ends up happening is we bite and the air goes faster, but also the pitch goes up yeah. because we're not in control of that. Mm. And so what I tell my kids is the other way to generate that fast air is to go over to the hose and turn the water up. And that's what I want us to do. When I take a deep breath, I'm generating faster air. And so I talk to my kids about breathing right. I talk to them about um, posture when they sit. You know, when they sit, they don't sit like I'm sitting now. You sit with your feet flat on the ground, you sit up straight. And when you breathe, this, first of all, this allows the whole the airway to be in perfect, in a perfect uh, space, number one. And number two, the second thing I talk about is, is breathing and making sure that our, our shoulders don't move yes, and nothing gets tense. Down, yeah. And because what happens is when we do this, immediately I'm not doing anything to my throat, but because my, my muscles are hitting it, my voice changes. Right. And then when my voice, my shoulders are down, everything is relaxed. So when we breathe up here and we get tense, that's what happens, and then we bite more because it's all about forcing the air out of our bodies. Mm. So a lot of my talking to students about breathing is just getting your feet on the ground, sitting up straight, <sighs> taking a deep breath from, not from up here, but from down here. Um, and I always talk to, them, talk to them to it. I say, when you take a deep breath, where are your lungs? And they say, right here. And I say, okay, if I was to punch you right there, would I hit your lungs? No, I hit your bone. And when I hit your bone, that your lungs are pushing up against that. So we can't breathe through our sternum. We have to breathe down. Right. And so what we want to do is keep our body relaxed and breathe from down here. Try and fill your lungs up like it's a balloon. Fill your stomach up like it's a balloon. Mm -hmm. and one of the troubles that I have with kids typically is that, especially young kids, when you ask a real young kid to take a deep breath, they go like this. No, 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 breathe, breathe in. Yeah, yeah. They don't breathe in. They don't think that there's an in part right, to the breathing. Right. And so that's one of the things I try and combat. It's yeah. just look, you gotta you gotta breathe in first. And when you breathe in, they do this immediately. Okay. Right. So relax. So a lot of a lot of my tone production talk is about just breathing. Uh, there's a, a really wonderful series called the Breathing Gym that I know you've dealt yeah, with. Yeah, I have that too. And it's you know these two tuba players, Sam Palafi and I forget the other guy. What's the other guy's name? Uh, Pat Sheridan. Pat Sheridan. And they talk just about breathing. And they talk about, you know, the direction of the air. They talk about opening your throat. A really cool uh, thing that I do with my students also is something I learned from the breathing gym, which is 
uh, to breathe, to open your throat when you're breathing, you need to have take your, your hand and place it on your throat, on your face, and when you breathe in, get this sound. That kind of whistling sound means that your throat's open. If yeah. you can do that, then you know your throat's open. If you can't, if you can't do that when you're breathing out, your throat isn't open. Yeah. And just pointing to the Adam's apple on boys and saying, look, when you breathe in, if your Adam's apple goes down, your throat's open. Oh, okay. You know? I never heard that one. Yeah. So that's that's a lot of the stuff I I, I know the, yeah. the brass players, uh, I, you know, I, at one point, there was a guy in New York who used to teach, he was a famous classical tuba player. I, I would love to know his name, remember his name. Yeah. But they used to do a thing where they would get PVC pipe. Oh, yeah, like, I've seen big like, guys do this. Style, that, yeah. Like that much around. Uh -huh. And and they'd go all the way back mm -hmm. with the PVC, and then they just breathe. And, and, it, was, and it, it, would, it would sort of get that gag thing going. So, yeah. and, but it would keep the throat open. Yeah, it would force you to have it to breathe with you your throat. Your throat, throat open. Open, yeah. Another thing that uh, Joe, another Joe Allen thing that he mm -hmm. used to t talk about was he would get a piece of paper, cut a piece of paper like two inches by two inches, or maybe mm -hmm. three inches by three inches square, and have you go up against, put it against the wall, <laughs> and breathe, and breathe, right, right, right. And, and try to yeah. keep it going, and just to get that the speed, the yeah. speed is all, it's all the about speed, speed of the air, and yeah. then really the speed and the evenness is the thing. Because yeah. when you're when I'm doing a long tone now. I'm trying to do I'm trying to do two things. When I do a long tune, the first thing that I'm doing is trying to get my air even, right? So it's not wobbling all over the place. Number one, and the second thing that I'm trying to do is get my my throat and my my embouchure in a place where I'm not biting. So a lot of times, what I'll do when I'm doing long tones is I'll do I'll low long tone for four, five, six seconds, and then I'll drop the octave. Because if, if it comes out, if the low octave comes out, then my high octave wasn't too tight. Right. And okay. so it kind of combats the, yeah. the real tightness in that mm. upper register. So I do those octaves. And then when I get to the low register, I do the opposite. So if I play like a G, a, l a regular G, like that's an easy note. I can just blow it without too much trouble. But I bite so much on the high register that what I try and do is I try and play that low G and then I'll, I'll blow that for four or five seconds, and then I'll blow the high note, the high G, I'll put the octave key on, okay. and see where that is, and see if it's if it's in tune, see if the air is still even, or whatnot, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's really to get my tone even throughout, and get my body used to doing things. You know? And overtone, you, you're an overtone guy. Yeah, I do yeah. a little bit of the overtone yeah. thing yeah. Overtones are yeah. really saxophone players. We, well, maybe we can get into that. Yeah, you can mm -hmm. show them. Overtones? Yeah. You can, you can. Oh, okay, overtones. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this Joe Allard gentleman, you know, who was a great, great teacher, he's passed away. His whole thing was overtones. And he would, so he would, I'm going to finger a low C. So he would do, like, you know, I'm going to play, I'm going to play, uh, I'm going to finger a low C, play the middle C. the G above that and try I'm not biting it's all coming from uh, the throat it's all coming from the larynx yeah and you can tell that because if you look at your mouth it's not moving at all so I always tell my students you know It's all overtones. It's all yeah. that whole cosmic overtone thing. Yeah. One, what is it? Octave fifth, octave third, fifth. Yeah, third, fifth. Octave th It's like the sixteenth. Anyway, yeah. anyway, it's very It goes cool. way too it's high. It's very cool. Yeah, it goes way too <laughs> high. So anyway, all right, we could be here all day yeah. talking about it. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's that's nice. And then um, technique-wise, uh, I would say, if you would like to talk about that, that'd be nice. Technique for me, I play a lot of scales. And I work on playing and them. And the kids, too. You know. Yeah, with kids, I think a lot of times we we learn scales wrong. You know, we're we're running through them as fast as we can. Exactly. And we're trying to, to make sure that we, we can play really fast. Well, the only way that you can play fast is if you can play slow. Right. And if you can't play it slow, you cannot play it fast. Right. You think you can play it fast. Ooh. But that's not the case. I had a kid the other day talking to me about... Uh, using the biz key on the saxophone. He wanted. He thought that you use the biz key for like a chromatic scale. And I was the like, biz yeah. key, by the way. Is, uh, yeah, the little, the little, little key. guy right there. And it's great for B flat. 
you know, it's great if you're playing an F major scale, I can keep my biz down and it works out because I just lift my finger just like it's a B. But if I'm going to use a chromatic scale, that's not going to work very right, fast. Exactly. So what I have to do is use a side B flat, which is a different B flat entirely. Right. But the point is that, you know, he was telling me like, oh yeah, I can just, that's just, just the way I do it. Yeah. No, it's not. Right. That it might be the way you do it, but yeah. it's inefficient and you're going to run into trouble. And the other chromatic fingerings that a lot of them don't know about. Like yeah. C and yeah, the C and the F sharp and, F -sharp and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 So anyway, uh, but I would like, uh, uh, I don't want to go too long, but there's something that I would love for you to show us this. So this, well, you could talk about it more, the Jerry, uh, there was a Jerry uh, Berganzi thing that uh, he taught Mark about leaving your tongue on the reed. Oh, yeah. Now, Mark, just let me proceed by saying, I, you know, we talk all the time about the sex. We're yeah. like some major geek, geek of IT. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah but, uh, <laughs> but he showed me this thing where you, and Jerry, I, I heard it from Jerry, too, but, it, you know, at the time I thought, yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> That's what yeah. I thought, too. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, you, where you, you leave your tongue on the reed, well, I'll have Mark talk about it, but I just want to say that I've been doing it. Man. It's so unbelievable. It puts your tongue where it should be. It yeah. just it trains your tongue, you know, to be in the right spot. And and I swear my tonguing yeah, is me better, too. faster and cleaner yeah. and crisper by doing this. You know, you know. Uh, Joe yeah. Allen used to say that that he used to talk about the French ooh. So when you say, do you know about this? Mm -hmm. So when you say ooh, if you say ooh, the sides of your tongue touch where your gut, where your where your gums yeah. and your teeth meet. Mm -hmm. Sure. So by saying ooh, you're creating, you're doing two things. You're creating a, more velocity. You're creating a sort of a oh, wind tone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you're relaxed, if you think about it, when you're relaxed, totally relaxed, and you're sleeping or whatever, mm -hmm. that's pretty relaxed. You, uh, <laughs> you, that's where your tongue is. Your tongue is. It, that's the relaxed position oh. for the tongue. So by consciously thinking about putting, using your tongue there, and just going. Ooh, and then you, and then two, that yeah, then comes two. Yeah. So two, 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 two. Oh, that's why. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. I yeah. never thought about it. Yeah, but it's a way. But this way is yeah. even more relaxing for, for the time. So anyway, I'll so stop talking. So when I was uh, when I was studying with Jerry, you know, when you study with a guy like that, you just you just listen to whatever he says, and that that was my approach studying with Jerry because he's so just amazing at everything. Um, and so one day he was talking to me about tonguing, and he and he showed me this thing, which is essentially taking your tongue and putting it on the reed while you're playing. So if I'm playing without my tongue on the reed. That's just a regular chromatic scale. But if I put my tongue on the reed. Right, and it's a weird sound. And I remember him teaching me, teaching me this and I was like, I don't, I don't understand why I'm doing this. Like this is just weird. Yeah. It doesn't, I don't understand the purpose of this. But I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to work it out. And one of the things he showed me, the initially what he showed me with that was to touch your tongue to the reed and, and play the note on one note, and then on the next note, use a regular note. So... Right? So I'm touching, the first note is tongue, and then the second note is... Yeah. And so now when I practice, that's the first thing that I do. And that, if you can do that, then you're able to get all the way up to the high register. That high F took me a long time to do because- Yeah, the upper register is, is so, it helps so much yeah, in the upper register. Yeah, because what happens in the upper register is you don't even know it, but you're tightening and you're pinching up there. And because of that, the tongue can't get in there. Well, if you practice this exercise, then that upper register starts to speak a lot better because your because your tongue has to get in there to touch the reed if yeah. for no other reason. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, I well, Jerry told me this, and, I, and if you listen, you can hear that. You can hear it. You hear it in more in Cannonball and in yeah, uh, mm -hmm. you're talking about people, yeah, before and Sunny. You, you know, but they used to use that as a device. And my understanding yeah. is that they would actually. Put their tongue on the like play a line to, on with yeah. the tongue to read it, which would back the air up and they could get more. Yeah, right. And then mm -hmm. they let it go. They 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 let it go to pop a to pop a note. <laughs> so if you listen to Cannonball, yeah. early Cannonball especially, 
you, you yeah, that's it, why he you sounds like that. And you'll yeah, hear, I totally and you'll, yeah, and you'll hear that in Sonny a lot. Yeah. For Sonny, that was like a device almost. The thing about this exercise to me that was really interesting was, you know, I worked it to death, and it was it was part of my routine, and I really hit it hard. You got the, down. The it. thing that I didn't recognize about it initially was that, you know, when you speak, you use your tongue in a lot of different ways, like the ooh or the two or la or whatever. Ooh. And when we practice uh, articulation on the saxophone, typically we are not thinking about all those other different types of shapes of the tongue. We're typically just thinking of two or some variation of that. And what this made me do is naturally use my tongue in ways that I never would have used it. And so I found that I would unconsciously use my tongue in ways that I never did before when I was improvising. And it made my facility a lot easier, it made my technique a lot easier because now my tongue is really strong enough to match what I'm doing from my finger standpoint, but also I'm kind of shading things the way that I want to yeah, shade yeah. them in ways that I never You I can never get closer to the read up it now. Yeah, 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 definitely. I know I know what the I know the speed of the air that I need. Yeah. Intuitively. It's not like, oh, well I need to be a little faster here or a little slower. Yeah. It just comes out because I've worked that enough. It's just like playing a G major scale. Like I don't think about, no one thinks about that anymore. Right, we just right. play it. And the reason is because we worked it so much to death that it's just yeah. a part of common knowledge. Stuff. This is a, a great, a, it's a great technique. Yeah, it's it really is. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. So anything else? Let's see. I have notes here, of course. Oh, practicing. Oh, what are you listening to? Um, I have a very strange listening habit. I, um, I listen to primarily jazz and classical music only. Mm. Um, I was listening to Mr. Salinas, the Beethoven Mass. I was listening to some Bach motets. I was listening to, what was the other thing? Oh, Schubert's Unfinished, because I love that. Um, I, was, I listened to like really weird, like Joscan Dupre, like, you know, Okay. Thirteenth century yeah, no kidding. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. I love that. And you stuff. write. You write a lot. Yeah, I do. I yeah. write a lot. Of stuff. He, he, by the way, he's a great writer. This oh, guy's a great writer. He writes a lot. Thanks. I do. Yeah. I actually just wrote a new tenor. I want you to oh, check out. Okay. Real. Um, so I listen to that on the classical side, um, and then I listen to I listen to like Messiaen and and Boulez and uh, uh, Berio and. Ligeti and all those guys. I really yeah. love all those guys. So Roger just, Sessions Justin Bieber. Not, not. That's not on my playlist typically. It's not. It's not. It might slip in there. Oh, yeah. is that Justin Bieber? Oh, or is that yeah. Messiaen? Oh, that was some, I always forget. That was some Justin Bieber, yeah. <laughs> but I have uh, my jazz collection is is strange also in that uh, really when I met you when I early on when I knew you I was into a very uh, conservative diet of jazz and I would listen primarily to six saxophone players Hank Mobley. John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Dexter Gordon, Gene Ammons, and Sonny Stitt. Those are those are my dudes. And if any anything that I saw with them on it, I would get. Yeah. And that would be the thing. Um, after I started studying with Hal Crook, I started listening to completely different things. So now, um, I listen to anything from like Pat Metheny uh, all the way to like Lester Young. Yeah. You yeah. know. So there's a there's a wide range of things. I have Great. I have in the car this. On the ride here today, I was listening to the Griffith Park series. You ever heard that stuff? No. Dude, Joe Henderson. It's Joe Henderson, uh, Freddie Hubbard, Chick Corea, Stanley Clark, and Lenny White. Oh, no, I know and that. It yeah, is I remember amazing that. stuff. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. did this a live thing. It's just it's unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so I'm listening to that. I have simply put my favorite Jerry Bergonzi album is on my front seat, too. Um, I was just listening to, I was telling you the other day, I was listening to the. Uh, the Joe Lovano with uh, Elvin Jones oh, yeah. and uh, uh, the trio, the fast Dave Holland. Yeah, yeah, yeah that trio stuff. Fascination. Great. And I listen to. I was listening to that today. I'm a. I listen to like saxophone players. Yeah. You know that's what I typically yeah. listen to. Joe Lovano, Michael Brecker. Well, I'm not that into, but I like um, Mark Turner, uh, Lauren Stillman. Um, oh, you like Lauren Stillman? Do you, yeah, I love oh, Lauren yeah. Stillman. You ever, you ever I, I know him. Man. He's my papa. Oh, is that yeah, right? I'll tell you that. One. I know some I'll dudes that play with him. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a great, oh, great Rich guy. Perry. Yeah, is, great player. I love Rich Perry. Uh, Walt Weisskopf is one of my favorite saxophone yeah, players too. Player, you know, yeah. so many great players. Yeah, there's there are just so many. Yeah. Billy Drews, I love yeah. Billy Drews. Dick Oates, you know, I know we're, I'm naming all the the Vanguard band guys, but yeah, there's just so many. Mark Turner, uh, Garzone, Lovano, uh, Dave Liebman. I love Dave Liebman. I, I really do. Yeah. 
Um, you got Steve Grossman. Yeah, early Steve Grossman live at <laughs> the Lighthouse. Yeah, that's, sure. that's the baddest yeah. thing I ever heard in my life. Yeah. It's just amazing. So we should probably wind this up. Um, we actually, uh, we we actually sort of we, well, we didn't prepare it, but we have this thing. We're gonna <laughs> see what happens. This is gonna. There's a little count on it. This is oh oh. This is actually we in a, in a in a previous episode, we use the same thing. This is called I real I. It's I, changed. The name has changed. It was I real B when I got it. Oh yeah, it's I, something else. I it's like a real book, but but it's got like base. Oh, I only use the bass lines. I yeah. love. I kind of like. Yeah, it. There are people that there are great. You know, people out there that hate us. You gotta practice, you know, it's just another way. It's, it's yeah, a it's virtual experience. All right, so it's gonna count us off. We're gonna play uh, this tune, it's uh, called um, Eternal Triumph. Eternal Triumph, written by Sensei. Sensei, that's yeah. right. All right, here we go. So hopefully, we'll, we'll get this. We'll get this. Because <laughs> there's a count off here, and uh, hopefully, we'll play all the right notes. All right. <laughs> So, uh, see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye, God everybody. bless you. Bye. You. Ciao. Your see pitch you. stays where it should. Your endurance goes uh, skyrockets because now you're taking all the pressure off your lips and you're putting it down here. Not all of it, but most of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, if depending on how you keep your lips, if you pucker them forward or smile, two different techniques, you know, your endurance can take off too. If you pucker forward, you've got more muscle between your teeth and the mouthpiece, which causes more of a cushion. You know, so that should help with your endurance too. It's all related to breathing. So I'm gonna do it sitting down, but so.